Well, I appreciate the invitation to speak. Uh, obviously, most people are well aware of the Battle of Gettysburg, as Michael pointed out. Second Winchester is actually the second largest battle of the Gettysburg campaign, but it's one that almost nobody ever hardly talks about. We hear a lot about Brandy Station, of course, the Calvary battle. We hear a lot about Gettysburg. Uh, but some of the other battles in the Gettysburg campaign really don't get talked about very much. In fact, Second Winchester in many books on the Battle of Gettysburg is only a paragraph or perhaps a page or two at the most. Uh, my good friend Eric Wittenberg and I decided, well, five or six years ago, that this was the most under-discussed, under-representative battle of the entire Gettysburg campaign. And we decided to write a book about it uh, to just uh, try to bring this battle back to light. So for those who may not be aware of the Shenandoah Valley, uh, this is the mid-Atlantic region of the United States. You know, see Washington, D.C., Baltimore, Philadelphia. Roughly, if you will, parallel to the Washington, Baltimore, Philadelphia line runs the Shenandoah Valley due, uh, due west of Washington. Uh, it runs northeasterly. Um, one observer called it a dagger pointed straight at the heart of the Yankees. Uh, and for over th the course of the Civil War, this was a main route of invasion for the Confederate Army on multiple occasions, uh, starting in 1862, again in 1863, and finally in 1864. Uh, the Shenandoah Valley will be a place to stage uh, operations towards uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, so this gives you a pretty good flavor. We're gonna talk today about Winchester uh, and the strategic importance or lack thereof of Winchester during the Gettysburg campaign. Uh, I've starred Gettysburg, just give you again the, the idea that the Shenandoah Valley actually points towards Gettysburg, which gives you a good reason why this was uh, an avenue of invasion during the campaign. Come back with me to June of 1863. The Confederates for some time avoid Pennsylvania. It's not a new idea. In 1862, Robert E. Lee had intended on invading South Central Pennsylvania. Uh, what culminated in the Battle of Antietam in September of 1862 was actually an invasion planned of Southern Pennsylvania. In fact, some of Robert E. Lee's scouts made it to the uh, Mason-Dixon line uh, separating slave state Maryland from free state Pennsylvania. And in October of 1862, uh, in a little known raid, Robert E. Lee sent Jeb Stewart and most of his Confederate cavalry into uh, southern Pennsylvania into the Chambersburg region uh, as a precursor to what is going to happen in 1863. So in 1863, Lee decides to try it again. Now he's got a lot of reasons for coming to Pennsylvania, not the least of which is he needs to win a victory on northern soil. At this point in the American Civil War, Robert E. Lee is riding pretty high. He's rarely lost a battle but he's no closer to winning the war than he has been previously. The Union sovereignly is hanging on. Uh, you know, the, there's still a movement in Parliament in, uh, in the UK to uh, discuss at least the concept of uh, British intervention or at least minimum British recognition of the Confederacy. Uh, and that's still being discussed in June of 1863 by a few members of Parliament. But by and large, Lee realizes that the war is going to turn on the American populace and how the response of the North uh, will play out. Now, in the fall of 1862, the Democratic Party had won several uh, seats in the United States House of Representatives, uh, riding the coattails of anti-Lincoln feelings. And Lincoln thinks that, or Lee thinks that in the summer of 1863 would be a great chance to, again, defeat the Yankees, but this time not in Virginia. Feeding him in Virginia hasn't really accomplished much other than to keep the Yankees off of Richmond. He thinks that by going into Pennsylvania and winning a battle in Southern Pennsylvania, which is highly democratic, by the way, with a lot of anti-Lincoln sentiment in the region, that if he can win a battle in that area, then Northern Democrats will rise up and will try to force President Lincoln to the negotiating table. Now, at least got some other secondary goals for the invasion, not the least of which is to get the battle and the war out of Virginia. Uh, Lee's army and that of his predecessor, Joseph Johnston, has been fighting 
in and out of the uh, Commonwealth of Virginia for almost 18 months. Food supplies are running low. The farmers need a summer off from invading armies so they can feed their family and bring in their own harvest. Another goal that Robert E. Lee and the War Department has is to draw attention away from Vicksburg, where Ulysses S. Grant is investing. Vicksburg, and as we all know, uh, culminate in the surrender of Vicksburg in July. Uh, and a final goal that Lee has is to break apart the Union Railroad lines. Uh, there are most of the supplies for the Union Army of the Potomac have come through Pennsylvania or neighboring uh, New Jersey and Delaware. Uh, and so threatening that region's railroads would certainly, uh, at least in the War Department's planning, grind things to a halt. So this is Lee's grand plan. His timetable is he wants to leave in early June, June 3rd, June 4th timeframe, wants to be in Pennsylvania within two weeks with the vanguard of his cavalry and three weeks within his infantry. So we're gonna focus our attention tonight on one, or this afternoon on one uh, third of Lee's army. This is the second corps commanded by Lieutenant General Richard Stoddard Yule. Uh, now, Yule is somewhat familiar with Southern Pennsylvania. In fact, his brother, Benjamin Yule, uh, lives, lived before the Civil War here in York, Pennsylvania. Uh, and Yule's sister-in-law uh, still lived in York at the time of the Gettysburg Campaign. Uh, so Richard Yule has a pretty fair knowledge of uh, that part of Pennsylvania. There are other Confederate officers, uh, again, with a strong understanding of the region. Yule's second corps is comprised of three divisions, uh, Robert Rhodes' division, Jill Borley's division, and Edward Johnson's division. All are major generals. Each division contains between 6,000 and 8,000 men. Uh, with this invasion force, uh, Yule sets out on June 3rd uh, and heads towards the Shenandoah Valley. Now, in the Shenandoah Valley, in Winchester in particular, which was considered to be the crossroads, if you will, of that part of the Shenandoah Valley is Robert Milroy. Uh, Robert Milroy is a major general in the United States Army. He is not a West Point graduate. He is not a trained military strategist. Uh, he is uh, from Indiana, uh, has never attended military school, has had some underclass in military science uh, as a high school uh, student. But he really doesn't have a lot of, uh, you know, military trained background. He does, however, have experience. Uh, he fought in the 1862 uh, Valley Campaign against Stonewall Jackson, uh, had some reasonable success, and was promoted from Brigadier General to Major General early in 1863. And he and his 8,000 men are now guarding uh, Winchester and that region. Milroy has, in one division that he has, uh, has three brigades. Uh, none of his brigade commanders have significant experience. Uh, the, many of the men, men fighting under Milroy have no combat experience whatsoever. Uh, a lot of these men have, have been guarding railroads, have been guarding bridges uh, in the mid-Atlantic region. Uh, many of them have been in the Washington, Baltimore, Harrisburg, Philadelphia corridor. Uh, again, trying to make sure that the Confederates do not disrupt rail traffic in particular. Uh, his troops are from a variety of U.S. states, uh, Pennsylvania, Connecticut, West Virginia, uh, Maryland, uh, as the predominant uh, troops in Milroy's force. This is the tactical situation in the Shenandoah Valley uh, as Lee's campaign begins. Uh, on June 9th, the battle, of course, is going to be fought at uh, in and around Culpeper with Jeb Stewart against Union Cavalry at the, the battle now known as Brandy Station. Uh, so after that battle on June 10th and June 11th, Richard Yule starts marching north towards the Shenandoah Valley. Uh, you can see Yule's movements in red. Uh, he's got uh, Robert Rhodes and Jill Borley on his right wing. His left wing is Edward Johnson uh, and uh, some of the divisional artillery train and the divisional wagons. They are headed towards Front Royal, Virginia, a uh, site is again associated with the 1862 Valley Campaign. You can see Milroy's forces in Winchester. Uh, Milroy has sent one of his brigades to Berryville to block the access to Snickers Gap. Uh, as you can see on this map, 
there are several ways of entering the Shenandoah Valley from uh, Northern Virginia. Uh, one of which is Manassas Gap. Uh, that's where the railroad uh, runs through. Uh, just to the south of that is Chester's Gap. That is where uh, Yule and Lee have planned for the crossing to take place. But the Union doesn't know that. Uh, they are concerned that the invasion is going to come through Snickers Gap, which if you look at the red arrow at Chester's Gap uh, and go up and count the gaps, it's Manassas Gap, Ashes Gap, and then Snickers Gap. So Milroy has moved one third of his men under uh, Colonel uh, Andrew McReynolds, a West Point graduate, uh, commander of the 1st New York Cavalry. He's moved them to Berryville to guard the access to the Snickers Gap. Milroy never dreams the Confederates are going to cross farther to the south, and so he has no forces whatsoever guarding Front Royal or Chester's Gap or nearby Manassas Gap, uh, where one might think uh, logically the Confederates might approach. But his big concern is Snickers Gap. On June 12th, Yule's Corps will pass through the Chester Gap and enter the Shenandoah Valley and march to Front Royal. Now, Milroy's defenses uh, that he's leaning on are unfortunately on the wrong side of town. Uh, most of the forts, you know, these are earthen forts that surround uh, the north side of Winchester, were built by Stonewall Jackson in 1862, and they face the north to prevent the Union forces in 62 from invading Winchester. Uh, again, these are in the wrong spot if you're trying to defend against a, an enemy coming from the south. Uh, now, Milroy does have some limited earthworks, mostly rifle pits and entrenchments on the south side of town on the heights near um, what's called Milltown, which was the cluster of uh, flour mills and paper mills uh, to the south of west of Winchester. But these three forts, West Fort, Star Fort, Fort Milroy, are going to play a large role in the Second Battle of Winchester. Uh, of these forts, the Star Fort remains. It's an excellent condition, it's been well preserved. And if any of you are fortunate enough to come back here to the United States in the future and have a chance to go to the Shenandoah Valley, the Star Fort is an excellent place to visit. To give you an idea of Civil War earthen uh, in, uh, fortresses. The largest fort that Milroy has was built again by Jackson in 1862. Uh, it had been known as uh, Fort Jackson at one time. Uh, most people knew it as the main fort. Uh, Milroy christens it for himself, calls it the main fort. There are only one known drawing of the fort that I've seen at least uh, that shows the Valley Turnpike uh, with some of the Union troops on it. And you can again see Fort Milroy on the small heights uh, directly above the turnpike. In the bottom left corner is an overhead view uh, drawn from U.S. Army to, uh, topographic engineers showing the heights of what was uh, Fort Jackson in 1862, again known as the main fort, now Fort Milroy. In the bottom right is one of the few surviving photographs that show the interior of Fort Milroy. This is believed to have been taken during the Gettysburg campaign showing some of the Union artillery uh, that the Confederates will eventually capture. Now, from Fort Milroy, you get a very good view of Winchester. Uh, this is, again, one of the few surviving photographs taken from within or on the ramparts of uh, Fort Milroy, looking towards the actual town of Winchester. Uh, Winchester has uh, roughly 2,000 or so people that live in it during the uh, 1863 uh, Valley Campaign. Uh, Many of the people have left uh, town uh, as a result of the 1862 fighting and have never returned. Uh, so the town has plenty of empty houses. Now, Milroy's men have taken over the houses of the pro-Confederate population. Milroy has put his officers in their homes. He's put uh, uh, his settlers uh, in some of the places. Uh, many of his officers, he, uh, Milroy's invited to bring their wives and their children uh, to Winchester. So for many men, this is almost like a picnic, if you will, that they are able to have their families close by. And there is very nice, uh, very lush area of Virginia uh, with a fairly pleasant climate. Uh, and it's, it's not actually quite, quite a nice uh, an assignment. And many of the men are thankful that they have been assigned to Winchester, not to the Army of the Potomac, 
which is going through the mud march uh, in January of, uh, of 1863. This is the second fort that I want to talk about. This is the Star Fort. This is the one that remains today and has been preserved by the Shenandoah Valley Battlefields Foundation. Uh, the Star Fort, as you can see from the bottom right of your screen, was an irregularly shaped star, if you will, uh, with plenty of really good fields of fire. This is occupied by artillery, uh, mostly during the uh, 1863, uh, early June period, uh, with some scattered troops in the rifle pits that surrounded it. Now, Winchester is a resort town. Uh, has a mineral springs uh, that, according to old Native American, uh, if you will, American Indian legends, uh, was almost like a pool of eternal life. If you drank the waters of Shawnee Springs, you would live forever. Uh, that if you died, you would return to life. And so the Shawnee warriors, uh, back during the Native uh, period of American history, would drink of the waters before they entered battle in the hopes that the great spirit would bring them back. Well, these legends had uh, kept on long after the Native Americans had left the region and the white settlers from uh, England and Scotland uh, have taken over the Shenandoah Valley. Uh, at this point in time, these legends still persist. Uh, and there are plenty of stores in Virginia that will sell bottled water from Shawnee Springs and other springs in and around the Winchester area medicinal water, if you will, that uh, supposedly would cure a lot of your ailments, again, not the least of which would bring you back to life. Uh, and there were a couple of people who still believed that and were openly selling uh, bottles of water with that. The reason I bring this up is this is a pristine place for a United States Army camp. Uh, so the 87th Pennsylvania Infantry from here in Gettysburg and York, Pennsylvania, and the 18th Connecticut uh, Infantry are camped in and around the Springs. Uh, other regiments are somewhat jealous uh, because they have less advantageous places to camp. Uh, this is the only known drawing of the 18th Connecticut in camp along the Springs, uh, but it shows what, again, this, you know, this beautiful area of Virginia would have looked like in 1863. On June 12th, the same day that the Confederates have entered the Shenandoah Valley, there are warning signs galore that Robert Milroy, the Major General in command of Winchester, should have been paying attention to. Uh, not the least of which is a small engagement, very obscure little fight that takes place on June 12th. Uh, the 87th Pennsylvania, again from Gettysburg and York area here in South Central Pennsylvania, uh, those men, many of which, again, are, are, are family members uh, whose farms on which the Battle of Gettysburg will be fought in just three weeks. Many of these men from Pennsylvania are part of an ambush. Uh, there have been a lot of Confederate cavalry activity throughout late May, early June, 1863. And Milroy has sent out the 87th Pennsylvania, has sent out a section of U, uh, U.S. regular artillery, as well as elements of the 13th Pennsylvania Cavalry. Uh, and their job is to watch the roads leading from the south into Winchester. Now, they're never going to go down to Front Royal. They're not going down to uh, Chester Gap. But they do encounter the vanguard of Ewell's oncoming Second Corps on late afternoon of June 12th. Uh, there'll be a small skirmish. The 13th Pennsylvania Cavalry will turn and run. Uh, the Confederate cavalrymen will chase them up and over a hill, right down into a pre-planned ambush where the 87th Pennsylvania and the artillery open up on the Confederate cavalry and drive them back. Now, the commander of this force, Colonel John Shaw of the 87th Pennsylvania, will report back to Milroy that these are not the typical partisan rangers. These appear to be cavalrymen from the Army of Northern Virginia. Milroy is in disbelief because the Army of Northern Virginia's cavalry is a brandy station. There's no way the cavalry should be here in the Shenandoah Valley. Least of all, there should not be any elements of Lee's army anywhere else in the Shenandoah Valley. Milroy tends to discount these ideas and as such uh, tends to poo-poo. Shaw's idea, yeah, Shaw of course is an amateur. 
uh, is a businessman from here in York. It doesn't have any military experience at all uh, of any great consequence. So Milroy takes it as the rantings of an amateur. Uh, Shaw's correct in his assessment, as it turns out, the Army in Northern Virginia indeed is coming to Winchester, uh, but Milroy really truly doesn't believe it. Uh, on June 13th, Saturday, uh, Milroy's going to find out that John Shaw was right. Uh, so does the War Department in Washington. I mean, they've been monitoring Confederate movements, and as best as the U.S. War Department can tell, that rebels indeed are moving on Winchester. Now, Milroy is a lifelong Republican uh, or Whig uh, before that. He is a friend of Abraham Lincoln's. In fact, it was through Lincoln's patronage, as well as uh, Milroy's strong support of Lincoln in 1860 and his help in delivering the Indiana delegation at the uh, convention, uh, Republican convention in Chicago to a, uh, back Abraham Lincoln. Uh, Lincoln has rewarded Milroy with a brigadier generalship and now, of course, as a major general. But Lincoln is very concerned about Winchester. It's isolated. It's exposed. It's really not of that much strategic value. More importantly, is Harper's Ferry uh, in the Charlestown area. So Lincoln has now sent orders through the War Department, through Baltimore, uh, Milroy's commander, uh, Robert uh, Shank, uh, commands the Middle, Middle Atlantic District, uh, has no ability to communicate with Milroy other than telegraphs. Uh, and he sends a series of telegraphs to Milroy saying, you know, you better get out. In fact, uh, the War Department had warned Milroy that the noose was tightening. Uh, but Milroy, again, doesn't move. He just stays put. Uh, even as uh, Richard Yule leads his three divisions uh, in three columns towards the Union Army. He's going to move Robert Rose's division directly towards Berryville to go attack Andrew McReynolds' uh, division of Milroy's, or a brigade of Milroy's division. And he's going to move his remaining two divisions, those of Jewel Borley and Edward Johnson, uh, on parallel roads towards Winchester. So get the picture. We have three Confederate divisions against one Union division. And in each of these individual fights that's going to prize the Second Battle of Winchester, we will have three Union, uh, three Confederate brigades against a single Union brigade. Uh, so the fight is going to start in the late afternoon of Saturday, June 20, <clears throat> June 13th. Uh, you can see the uh, tactical situation. Uh, approximately seven or eight miles southwest of Winchester is the village of Kernstown. Uh, Kernstown had been the site of a battle in 1862 with Stonewall Jackson. It will again be the site of a battle in 1864 during Phil Sheridan's uh, Valley Campaign. Here in 1862, Kernstown is where the Second Battle of Winchester begins. Again, Winchester was a battle in 1862. Uh, so you had Winchester and Kernstown as battles in 62. You're going to have the same area being fought now on June 13th. Uh, Milroy. Uh, has troops, untried troops from Ohio, uh, 110th and 123rd Ohio Volunteers, as well as the 12th and 13th Pennsylvania Cavalry. And he's got one battery of uh, uh, volunteer artillery from West Virginia. Now, keep in mind, just for clarity's sake, West Virginia will not become a state until June 20th. Uh, so technically, this is the Virginia Cavalry. Union Virginia Cavalry, uh, but we're one week away from West Virginia becoming a separate state. Uh, so for the purposes of this discussion, we will consider these to be West Virginia troops. Uh, John Gordon's Georgia Brigade swings uh, to the Northwest and attacks the 12th West Virginia Infantry, while the Louisiana Tigers, uh, Harry Thompson Hayes' famed brigade uh, that most of us have, have long heard of, uh, the Tigers will attack the Union position on the heights southwest of Winchester. This fine building still stands. This is the Pritchard House, uh, a prominent landmark in the First Battle of Winchester, the First Battle of Kernstown, and now the Second Battle of Winchester. Uh, behind the, this hill, uh, house, which has been a field hospital and will be a field hospital in future battles that take place in and around Winchester, uh, on the heights beyond, just behind this 
uh, will be the 123rd Ohio and 110th Ohio and the uh, Battery D, 1st West Virginia Artillery. The, the Louisiana Tigers pretty easily clear the Milroy's troops off of this hill. And at the same time, uh, John Gordon pictured here in his Georgians will drive the 12th West Virginia off of the adjoining ridge line on Sandy Ridge. So the battle has not begun well for Milroy at all. He's already seen his men fall back more than a mile uh, towards Winchester uh, to the Northeast uh, as howling Confederates continue their pursuit. Uh, now this is a photograph taken looking south towards the toll gate, the buildings that you see on the uh, upper uh, right center of the photograph are the toll facility where people would pay a toll to use the Valley Turnpike. Uh, this is uh, today's US Route 11. Uh, all this area has been lost and not preserved. This is shopping centers, gasoline stations, uh, uh, convenience stores, uh, and all kinds of urban sprawl today. But in 1863, this area uh, was pristine. Two regiments of untried Ohioans, again, the 110th and 123rd Ohio, are going to rally at this point where this photograph is taken. They are going to charge down the valley back up the opposite hill, and they are going to attack the Louisiana Tigers and stop their charge. Uh, very ambitious and actually uh, very audacious move by these amateur Ohioans, uh, again, who have never really fought a battle in their, their lives, and they stop one of Robert E. Lee's best brigades. Uh, this is the toll gate, by the way, now looking the other direction. Uh, so you can see the Valley Turnpike. If you can see the little valley in between, and you'll see the spot where the last photograph was taken uh, just uh, in the middle of the picture. Uh, the toll gate, ironically, in 1864, during the uh, third battle of Winchester, the, the woman who runs the toll gate is going to try to force Phil Sheridan's army to actually pay a toll for every Union soldier that crosses the spot. Now, here in 1863, that doesn't happen. But in 64, famously, uh, the toll keeper tries to get money for each of uh, the thousands and thousands and thousands of Union soldiers that are going to cross this point. But second battle, Winchester, the first day of the battle ends with darkness. Uh, Early's advance has been halted by the, the Buckeyes' stunning counterattack. Milroy's men are quite pleased. They have defeated, in their minds, the Army in Northern Virginia. Uh, they think that because Winchester is not of much importance, that uh, these Confederates will simply march past and they'll leave. But Richard Yule's got no intentions of moving past Winchester and leaving Yankees in his rear. Uh, he wants to drive Milroy out, preferably capture Milroy and his men if he can. Well, the evening of June 12th, uh, Milroy brings as many of his wounded as he can back to the Taylor Hotel. Uh, this is now a fine restaurant in downtown Winchester. The building still stands. Uh, he's also got almost a thousand sick or ill Union soldiers that are being housed in downtown Winchester. There have been uh, problems with typhoid fever in the weeks before the battle, second battle of Winchester. And many of Milroy's men are still uh, either incapacitated or are feeling the effects still, uh, weakness and uh, other side effects from recovering from the fever. That night, June 12th, it's just miserable. Uh, like many American Civil War battles, a major thunderstorm rages uh, uh, that evening. Uh, soaking these dirt roads. Uh, the turnpike is gravel, but the rest of the roads in the region are a muddy quagmire. Uh, and throughout the night, Milroy does manage to get McReynolds troops back out of Berryville uh, after they've been defeated there by Robert Rhodes' division of the Army of Northern Virginia. And so for the first time since, uh, you know, winter, Milroy now has all three of his brigades together in and around Winchester. He brings McReynolds' troops into the Star Fort, uh, and Milroy will concentrate most of the rest of his men, his other two brigades, in the main fort and in the west fort to the immediate west, northwest of town. It's now Sunday morning, June 14th, the second day of what will be the three-day uh, Second Battle of Winchester. 
you see the town in the little map that I've enclosed in the bottom right. Uh, these are the heights around the flour mills and paper mills uh, that are in mill town heights. Uh, again, most of the mills were concentrated around uh, the creek for water power uh, for their water wheels. But Milroy has put, again, the 12th West Virginia, now the 122nd Ohio, as well as that West Virginia battery uh, under John Carlin, Captain John Carlin. Uh, and that is his main defenses to the south of town. The 18th Connecticut is still guarding the springs uh, with the medicinal springs, if you will, uh, with additional artillery in the 5th Maryland. Uh, John Gordon is going to move his uh, Georgians into a position to attack. And again, for the second time in two days, Gordon will engage the 12th West Virginia Infantry. Uh, they will push back the West Virginians and Ohioans again. Uh, and allowing Generals uh, Ewell and Early to get on the heights. Uh, and from this view, taken again uh, from the rough area of the Union uh, forces on Mill, uh, Milltown Heights, uh, you get a view of the Shenandoah Valley in the area that Yule plans to attack. From this position, Yule scouts the Union defenses and he decides on a flanking movement. Uh, he's going to send Jub Worley's entire division minus uh, one brigade that he's left behind at Kernstown to police that battlefield and uh, to act as a mobile reserve. Uh, Early is going to move uh, two of his four, uh, three remaining brigades on a flanking movement. It's going to take the Louisiana Tigers under Brigadier General Harry Hayes, and he's going to take William Extra Billy Smith's Virginia Brigade formerly Early's own uh, brigade before his promotion to divisional command. Uh, and he's going to leave John Gordon engaged against the West Virginians and Ohioans. Uh, this is actually one of the finest flanking movements that Richard Yule will ever do. Uh, we may remember that this is Yule's first battle as a corps commander. Uh, with Stonewall Jackson's death in May of 1863 at Guinea Station, after being uh, wounded by his own troops at uh, Chancellorsville. Uh, Lee has divided his two corps of the Army in Northern Virginia into three corps and has assigned A.P. Hill and uh, Richard Yule to command of what had been elements of Stonewall Jackson's force. Uh, so this is Yule's first battle as a corps commander. Uh, and he does really, really well. Uh, he's not gonna do real well at all at, all at Gettysburg. Uh, in just three weeks. Uh, but here at 2nd Winchester, Yule is frankly brilliant. He does a really, really good job. Uh, he's going to move his men secretly into position to launch an attack on the West Fort, uh, much to Milroy's shock, while Edward Johnson's forces are going to pin, and uh, Gordon's brigade, are going to pin uh, uh, Milroy's attention to the South and keep Milroy focused on what's going to happen there. Now, this is the actual terrain that uh, Early is going to move two of his brigades along. You can see the small hill in the center of the picture that screens the movements from Milroy's view. Uh, you can see the low mountain range uh, to the upper left of the photograph. That is where uh, Early's destination is for the Louisiana Tigers and Smith's Brigade. Uh, they are to align themselves on the rear of that ridge line. Uh, in the upper left of the picture. They will put 20 pieces of artillery on the backside of that ridge line uh, behind the trees that you see where the arrow is pointing to and prepare to bombard uh, the Union forces. Uh, throughout the afternoon of Sunday, June 13th, Milroy's attention again is drawn to the south where John Gordon uh, is engaged again with the 12th West Virginia and uh, Walker and Stewart's and Williams brigades of uh, Edward Johnson's division of the uh, Ewell's Corps, Second Corps, uh, are engaging with the troops again from the Connecticut in and around the uh, uh, their campsite near the Springs, and other troops from Pennsylvania and Maryland uh, in Ohio are trying to defend that area. Milroy does not. Understand that the main fight is going to come from the West. His attention is to the South. 
Uh, there is some street fighting that takes place. This again is one of the main streets in Fred, uh, this is Frederick Street in Winchester. Uh, again, you can see what it would have looked like in the mid 1860s. Uh, dirt roads are very muddy, of course, from the overnight torrential rainstorm. Uh, and during this middle of the part of the attack, the 12th West Virginia, one of their lieutenants on his own leads a charge towards John Gordon's Georgians and will receive the uh, Congressional Medal of Honor uh, in response uh, years later for his bravery at the Second Battle of Winchester. Concurrent with this, Robert Rose's division is now moved from Berryville north to Martinsburg, uh, where additional Union forces are, and they are going to fight a Allied battle, part of the Second Winchester mini campaign, if you will, uh, at Martinsburg, which is also going to fall uh, to the oncoming Confederates. Well, about 5 p.m. on Sunday, June uh, 13, 1863, the Louisiana Tigers attacked the Union forces uh, at the West Fort. This is the 116th Ohio and an inexperienced regiment now facing its first combat activity. Uh, and the Louisiana Tigers, of course, are veterans. They fought in the Valley Campaign under Stonewall Jackson in 1863. They are quite used to travel throughout the Shenandoah Valley. And in fact, this is the same ground, much of the same ground that they fought on in 1862. Uh, the Tigers are going to launch an attack. Uh, you can see the ground today in the bottom photograph. Uh, much of the second Winchester battlefield actually is in private hands. Uh, very little of it has been interpreted or preserved, uh, but luckily um, large chunks of the battlefield have not yet been developed. Uh, so there's still hope that the Shenandoah Valley Battlefields Foundation can at some point in the future raise enough funds to purchase uh, the land that you see below over which the Louisiana Tigers launched their decisive attack on Sunday afternoon, June 13th. Um, the Tigers are going to sweep forward from behind that ridge line. Uh, they are going to attack the Buckeyes, uh, Ohioans in the West Fort. They're going to drive them back across the ridge line into Milroy's main lines. Uh, you see the main uh, Fort Milroy and the Star Fort in this illustration. Uh, while again, Gordon and the artillery are to the south of town, engaged with the 12th West Virginia and the 18th Connecticut is trying to protect the approaches from the southeast uh, from Allegheny, Edward Johnson. Louisiana Tigers attack is quite successful. They will carry the West Fort. Uh, again, here's another view of this pristine uh, part of the battlefield. Uh, the West Fort would have been just to the left of where you see the building with the white roof uh, in, the, in the pine trees in the upper left of the ridge line. Uh, the West Fort is just about there. Uh, and again, this is the ground over which the Louisiana Tigers are going to attack. Uh, from the site of the fort, now this is looking down towards the site of the second ridge line where Robert Milroy is uh, with his men in Fort Milroy. Uh, the Ohioans and the regular artillery men abandoned their guns, leaving six uh, pristine three-inch rifles to be captured and turned around by the Confederates that will then use them uh, to bombard Fort Milroy from this position. Well, the second day of the, again, three-day Battle of Second Winchester ends with a massive artillery duel uh, well into the night. Well, Milroy finally, finally decides it's time to leave town. Uh, he'd been ordered on June 12th to leave Winchester. It's now the middle of the night on Monday, June 15th, very early in the morning. At two o'clock on that morning, Milroy finally decides it's time to leave Winchester. He's going to spike his remaining artillery, uh, more than 20 guns. He is going to dump the artillery ammunition into cisterns or wells. He will abandon his wounded and his ill. He will leave probably as close to a thousand men behind in Winchester who do not have the capability of walking to Harper's Ferry uh, or walking to, into West Virginia. Uh, to uh, the designated rendezvous positions. Well, this is exactly the move that Richard Yule has anticipated that General Milroy would make. Uh, and in preparations for blocking Milroy's escape route, General Yule very wisely and uh, quite, quite smartly 
has moved uh, most of uh, Allegheny Johnson's division uh, to the northeast and toward the west of Winchester, and he has now blocked the Valley Turnpike. There's no way for Milroy to make it. Uh, and even if he did, the roads to the north are now blocked by Robert Rose Division in Martinsburg. Uh, so the only hope Milroy has is to somehow break through the Confederate lines and make it to Harper's Ferry. That's exactly what he's trying to do. Uh, you can see on this map of the final day of the Battle of Second Winchester, Milroy has abandoned the town, has abandoned the forts. He's left behind the women, the children, the wives, the sweethearts, uh, the family members of his officers. He's left behind the settlers, uh, the medical corps, the chaplains, uh, most of the non-combatants, uh, the wagon trains, He's left everything behind, mounted as many men as he can on his artillery horses and supply wagon horses, and they are trying to escape to Harper's Ferry. Uh, you can see Yule's movement correspondingly, his flank march again on the uh, middle of the night on uh, very dark uh, roads through the woods of Virginia. He has arrived in position before Milroy and is now blocking Milroy's access to the Charlestown Road. Milroy cannot go north on the Valley Turnpike because Rudd's division is up there. His only escape route is the Charlestown Road. Uh, and that's right where uh, George Stewart's brigade of uh, North Carolina and Virginia uh, troops is now sitting. Uh, they're sitting along the railroad tracks. Uh, Stewart has got there first. Uh, the railroad, this is from the bridge on the Charlestown Road looking down into the uh, railroad tracks that are underneath the bridge. Uh, to the north side of the bridge is Stewart's Brigade. To the south side of that bridge is Williams Louisiana Pelican Brigade. And this is the bridge over the railroad tracks, the only known photograph of the uh, wartime uh, bridge. Uh, I've taken the, the previous picture I took from the modern bridge uh, that now sits at this site. Uh, but this is a fine, fine, fine defensive position to protect the Charlestown Road. Uh, the Confederates are going to move artillery into position. You can see on one of the few monuments on the second Winchester battlefield, this is Lieutenant Colonel uh, Snowden Andrews of Maryland, who commands the artillery of Yule's division, uh, Yule's Corps. Um, and you can see the, the bridge in the upper right on this uh, fine bronze sculpture from the Andrews Memorial. Uh, the fighting at Second Winchester final day begins at about uh, 2.50, 3 o'clock or so in the morning. Uh, and it's a one-sided affair. The Yankees are trying to break to get down the Charlestown Road. Uh, you can see, again, Milroy desperately launching attacks on this defensive line. Uh, the Confederates have piled up knapsacks. They've piled up uh, timber, uh, any rocks, anything they else they can on the embankments of the railroad, uh, making this a very, very strong defensive position. One that Milroy has, frankly, no prayer of uh, dislodging. And least of all, he launches five separate disjointed attacks and never once uh, puts his full force into play. Uh, his men are in real trouble. And right in the middle of this, Robert Milroy himself will uh, start panicking. You can see Milroy in the middle of this photograph on the black horse. Uh, it's actually not accurate. He was riding a white horse at the time. This is the 18th Connecticut to the left of 5th Maryland to the right. And in the distance behind the railroad embankment is Williams, Louisiana. Pelican Brigade of uh, Richard Yule's uh, Second Corps. Uh, now, Milroy is going to ride off to the battlefield. It's one of the few times in United States military history that the commanding officer of American troops abandons his men uh, to, the to the fate of the enemy and rides off with the staff. Milroy totally abandons the field. He's gone. Uh, he's breaking through on his own. He will successfully escape from the battlefield. Uh, this is the field that you saw in the previous photograph. Uh, this is what it would have looked like uh, when I took this picture a couple of years ago. Unfortunately, uh, condominiums now line part of the site. Uh, townhouses have been built uh, as we lost this section of the battlefield. 
Uh, here's the, uh, the monument to Snowden Andrews that I showed you a minute uh, before, showing the defensive line here. Well, Milroy's two brigade commanders that are left, McReynolds has managed to escape with most of his men, uh, but his other two brigade commanders, uh, Brigadier General Washington Lafayette Elliott and Colonel William G. Eli, uh, both surrender. Uh, they, don't, they don't know what else to do. They can't break through the Confederate lines. Milroy is gone. Uh, and as dawn approaches, the Union resistance is all but gone. Uh, as the Stonewall Brigade comes in on their flank, uh, the Union forces, some of which try to fight their way out, but the majority of Milroy's force will surrender. Uh, the Confederates are going to take Winchester at the same time. Uh, Jim Worley's men will march into town. This is the Taylor Hotel again, uh, and they will take over the town of Winchester. Milroy is going to lose more than 4,000 men as prisoners of war. That's more than half of his division. Uh, they're going to be brought back into those three forts as well in, as in the courtyard of the county uh, courthouse. Uh, and Milroy's scattered forces are going to try to reconstitute themselves at either Harper's Ferry, uh, shown in this illustration, or many of his men are the survivors are going to walk, walk all the way to Pennsylvania. We're, we're talking about a hundred mile walk, uh, and they're coming to South Central Pennsylvania. Uh, this happens to be their rally point is a town uh, northwest of Gettysburg, uh, now known as Everett, Pennsylvania, then known as Bloody Run. Uh, Milroy himself manages to get on a train uh, at Harper's Ferry. And he will ride back to Baltimore to meet with his commander, Robert Shank, uh, to plead with Shank for additional forces. Milroy, uh, having abandoned the field, is being censored and will face a court of inquiry eventually. He's actually put under arrest, but he uh, ignores that, gets on a train north, goes here to Pennsylvania, and tries to meet with the governor of the Commonwealth, Andrew Curtin, to plead his case that he needs to be given back command of his men. Uh, but by now it's been gone. His division has been uh, given to another man or what's left of his division. Milroy will spend the rest of 1863 trying to get his command back. He never will. He will be assigned another role out in uh, Tennessee in 1864, where surprisingly Robert Milroy will win his one and last battle of the Civil War when he'll beat Nathan Bedford Forrest in a small engagement in Tennessee. But his career in the Eastern Theater has been wrecked. Even his good friend Abraham Lincoln cannot save him. What Lincoln can do now is worry about Pennsylvania. He's going to call out 100,000 militia, uh, state troops, uh, untrained troops in most cases, to try to protect West Virginia, Ohio, and Pennsylvania from Robert E. Lee's oncoming army. So the epilogue, as we all know, this is June 12th, 13th, 14th, and 15th that we've been discussing. Battle of Gettysburg will occur on July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, uh, just a scant, you know, a little over two, two and a half weeks after the conclusion of the Second Battle of Winchester. Milroy lost 54% of his men with more than 4,000 men captured as prisoners of war. Many of you who are buffs of World War II history will realize this is the highest percentage lost in terms of prisoners of war by a United States military unit until the Battle of Corregidor in the Philippines in World War II. So between previous to Corregidor, second Winchester is the next uh, disaster uh, in terms of prisoners that the US Army has fallen. And again, most of us have never heard of this battle because the Northern press sweeps us under, uh, rightfully so, uh, and kind of ignores this disaster and then celebrates the victory at Gettysburg. Milroy's lost again almost 4,500 men, while Richard Yule has lost 269. It's Richard Yule's finest hour in the Civil War. As mentioned, Milroy's trying to fight his, uh, for his reputation, but he and his men come to the belief that they saved Pennsylvania. They believe for the rest of their lives that you know, those three days, uh, uh, June 13, 14, and 15, that they successfully held off Richard Yule uh, cost Robert
Robert E. Lee a chance to take Harrisburg and to win a victory in Pennsylvania before the Army of the Potomac could arrive. Uh, that's how they believed. I personally think that it didn't make a lot of difference. Uh, but uh, the veterans of Winchester would proudly say that they saved the Union. Probably not, but that's at least what Bob Milroy's legacy was. In fact, when Milroy dies in Seattle, Washington, many years after that, uh, he tells his family, uh, you realize that, you know, I saved the Union. On behalf of my publisher, Savas Beatty, I thank you members of the American Civil War Roundtable of the United Kingdom for your kind attention this morning, this afternoon for you guys, uh, as we've discussed the second largest and certainly least known battle of the Gettysburg Campaign of 1863.